So good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and jump into the book of Acts. And so we are at the end of chapter three. Um, and so we're just going to go ahead and jump into chapter four. So Acts two, we've had the story of Pentecost. Acts three, we've continued this chain of events that are trying to mirror the New Testament acts of Jesus. These first disciples, the apostles, are doing their ministry and doing their best to make sure people understand that this is not something new, but instead it is a continuation of the work of Christ. And so they've emphasized again and again, we're doing this in the name of Christ. Not necessarily that the name has magical powers just by speaking the name, but instead that that name gives them authority. They're not magic workers on their own, but they're doing this through the authority that Jesus has bestowed upon them to continue the ministry of Jesus through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to see all of those themes continue as we dig into chapter four. So let's begin. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made their prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power... Or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are being asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is... The stone that was rejected by you, the builders, it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing before them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. So old. <laughs> <laughs> Ancient. All right, there's a lot there to dig into. So let's go back to the first verse of this chapter. We're told that the leaders who are gathered are the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. Why is it interesting that they're pointing out the Sadducees? So let's just kind of take a step back. If we remember from readings of the gospel, yeah, go ahead, Robin. You got it. They don't believe in the resurrection. Absolutely nailed it. So the major groups of religious leaders. You have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes. The Sadducees in particular do not believe in resurrection. The Pharisees do. So this is just evidence to us. We have writings from all these groups that there's a lot of different ideas about resurrection, even within this um, time frame for Judaism. So early Hebrew beliefs didn't believe in resurrection. They believed that there was this kind of place of annihilation called Sheol, that after life, you were just kind of wiped out. Perhaps there's some sort of after soul lived in this place of Sheol, but not with any sort of recognition that it wasn't afterlife. But 
everything starts to develop. And so there's new ideas about afterlife and resurrection, but the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection. And so they're the ones, there's a story that they come to Jesus and they say, because of the Leverite marriage laws, when you would marry a brother, if your husband died, say a woman married her husband and then he died and she married the husband's brother and he died and so on and so forth. And she married all the brothers then whose spouse would she be in heaven? They ask this to trick him because they want him to admit that he believes in resurrection because they don't. And so that's why this is emphasized here that it, this is the Sadducees. They still don't believe in resurrection. And yet these Jewish folks, Peter and John, are proclaiming a resurrection through Jesus. So they arrest them. And what do you think is at stake here? I mean, what is their crime? If you remember what just happened, they healed a man. Not really a crime. They've helped someone who previously couldn't walk, walk, and yet they're being arrested for this. So what else might be at play here? What's on the Sabbath? Was it on the Sabbath? Great question. We are not told that it's on the Sabbath. They think it's some sort of magic or something. That's also a great thought. Put your, you all aren't used to doing this, which is great, but put yourself in the mind frame of corrupt leadership. <laughs> yeah, that's probably, a, that's probably a good theory here. And it's why they ask their question, what authority do you have to do this? Why are you getting followers now? We already took care of this Jesus guy and now... Here we have the problem continuing, and we want to know, by what authority are you riling up people, getting them to follow you, getting them to proclaim that you're doing something miraculous? And so, who are these guys? The text wants us to know a little bit about Peter and John, to kind of put them in juxtaposition with the religious leaders. They're nobody, right? They're fishermen. Jesus called these nobodies. And these nobodies somehow are the ones working in the authority of Jesus's name. What do you get out of that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned something when we're getting started about paralleling the life of Jesus. So I'm thinking about the moment when they, is it the Pharisees? But the, the, the moment when Jesus says, give me a coin, his face is on it. But mm -hmm. they're asking, like, he, he's... Yeah, yeah. And he was sort of nobody too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Kevin just says, mentioned at the beginning that we're kind of paralleling to the life of Jesus. This entire section feels as if it's straight out of the Gospels. And instead of Peter and John, it's Jesus. Jesus has asked the same questions. Wait a minute. You're the son of John the carpenter. You're a nobody. You're from Galilee. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. And yet somehow the spirit of God is able to move through this nobody. And Jesus calls Peter and John, these fishermen from Galilee, they're nobodies. And yet this religion is able, not this religion, this faith in what Christ is able to do because of the power of God is being able to promulgate through these nobodies. This is not a religion or a faith or a movement based on power or authority of any specific human group, but instead by working through people who are nobodies, the power of God is made evident. And so that's a theme we'll see throughout the letters of Paul as well, and evidenced here in the stories of the apostles. And so we have the religious leaders asking them, by what authority are you doing this? You're nobody. And they say, well, once again, we're doing this through the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we get another quotation from Hebrew scriptures to kind of gird their claims. And we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks how it's really unfortunate, the pronouns that they're using, because it's later the basis for anti-Semitism. And that just continues here. I I've made an argument that grammatically the way it's structured is it's, it's not so much of you, the Jews, because they're speaking as Jewish people, but more so as anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus and what he came to do because of that unbelief, you have put him to death. 
but there's always an opportunity for repentance and coming into belief. So he says that again, you all are the ones whom you all crucified Jesus. Now God's power raised Jesus from the dead. And that is because the stone that was rejected has become the cornerstone. And you all know basic architecture of cornerstones being the crux of the foundation. This is also kind of a keystone or a capstone. So rather than being the foundation, the stone right at the top that the, holds the archway together without which the archway couldn't come together and be held. So this is the, the foundation and yet you have rejected the foundation. We talked a little bit about this last week um, because this is kind of the basis for born again language and salvation language, unless you believe in the name of Jesus and you won't be saved. And it's only through the name of Jesus by which you can be saved. Um, but these ideas haven't really developed yet. Instead, what we have here is what Jesus did on the cross is effective for the salvation of all people. So it's only through the life and death of Jesus that salvation can come to humanity. There's no other path of salvation. There's no good works that must be performed. There's no laws that must be upheld. Instead, it is the life and death of Jesus and the resurrection that God has um, come to be that salvation comes to us. All right. So the council comes together. They start debating what do we do with this? And again, this feels like it's from the Gospels. This is what they said when Jesus was creating all of this commotion. They said, wow, the people are following him. If we try to put an end to it, they're just going to turn against us. And if you remember, what's at stake for them in terms of creating a stable environment within Israel? They can kind of do their little thing under the Romans. Yeah. But if things get out of hand, they could lose their position as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, we can put a little um, empathy into this, understanding where they're coming from. It is not usual for the Roman Empire to give other religious communities free reign to practice their religion. But through various rebellions and negotiations over time, the fact that this little Jewish community was actually very successful in some of their rebellions, they come to an agreement, look, you're in this small little part of the world, just stay there, practice your faith, don't make any commotion, and you can keep doing what you're doing. Sacrifice at your temple, have all of your religious ceremonies, just be good. And so they want to protect their faith. They want to protect their community. They have every reason to make sure that these false messiahs, because Jesus isn't the only one claiming to be the messiah, there's all sorts of political factions trying to create rebellion and to throw off Roman rule. And so they really want to keep everything tempered. That's why they were upset with Jesus, by and large. That's why they're upset with Peter and John. They just want everything to be calm and something's happening here. The people are following them. They don't want to upset anyone. And so like, okay, let's just tell them stop and hope that they stop. So they threaten them again, tell them not to say anything. Peter and John have this powerful rebuttal. Listen, you decide whether what we're doing is right in the sight of God, but all we're doing is sharing about what we've seen and heard. This is empirical. We're not making this stuff up. We have eyewitness testimony about what's going on and how can we do anything but share about what we have seen and heard. And then we get the ageism here. Any questions, comments, or thoughts from this passage? Let's see here. Just Good morning, wishes. Okay. Yeah, Ben? I was just wondering about the use of the, I think it's the salt on the tip of the cornerstone. Yeah. Um, like, how legit is that scriptural interpretation? You know, um, it doesn't seem like the psalm was about the Messiah, so they're kind of 
doing kind of that academic reading are also, are they kind of trying to show us how to do scriptural interpretation? Like, are we supposed to back apply everything that was in the Hebrew scriptures about Jesus? Yeah, absolutely great question. So when you're doing biblical scholarship and trying to understand, trying to interpret Hebrew scriptures, um, kind of the guidance is to avoid the classic Christian approach to reading the Hebrew scriptures, which is to use this as our guidance for how to do that interpretation, which is read Jesus back into everything, which is what the early Christians do. Everything is allegorical um speaking to something else so this is kind of where that starts happening uh however the scriptures when they're written or spoken also had a meaning to the folks who are hearing it for the first time so if you're doing just scriptural interpretation in a vacuum trying to understand the text you first want to try to understand what did this mean to the original hearers however the early christians are absolutely doing this work where they're going back and saying, wait a minute, there are all of these signs pointing to the Messiah and pointing to Jesus. So the gospel writers are already doing that. <laughs> Luke Acts is doing that as well. Yeah. Could we also say that's kind of a, a major theme of the Bible? Joseph, oh, yeah. Moses, David, they're all the, the low people, the weak people that get pulled up and then they go to Jesus. Oh, my gosh. And Peter and Adam. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is. 100% a major theme of scripture. Every person that God calls as an objection to why they're not qualified, that they're not the right person for it. That's kind of the basis for servanthood within scripture is to understand with enough humility that the calling of God isn't placed on us because we're better than God, um, but that God's working through us, even through our limitations. So yeah, David, King David being called as the youngest son whom um, his father Jesse doesn't even want to bring him in because how could God call David? Yeah. Well, I just I, I have to wonder because these were uneducated men. Mm. Um, you know, there's a passage about after Jesus had written on the road to Emmaus where he's showing them how scripture, yeah, like kind of pulling it all together. And it makes me wonder, could they really have quoted scripture or were they remembering something? You know, he said this and he said that, and you know, it just kind of stuck with them. And so, so you know, maybe Jesus was doing it, and they were just following his example. I mean, he he can't know that. No, but no. Even that they were not educated, they needed to know scripture inside yeah. and out. Like yeah. that the religious leaders might may not have heard it from him because that's explicitly what was said. Was yeah. Done there. Yeah. Ah, oh, I love that. You do such a good job of getting into the well, emotions of the people. Very vivid yeah, <laughs> I like that. Um, so Robin's comment is, you know, just remembering that these are uneducated folks, mm -hmm. their ability to quote scripture and to tie it into the work of Jesus. Maybe there's something more going on than just straight quotation. They're remembering what Jesus did. They're remembering how Jesus spoke of the scriptures. They're realizing, wait a minute, we experienced this. And this does match what we know of the scriptures. I, I could absolutely see that going on. Yeah, Kevin? Well, I'm just thinking you said that uh, in response to Ben, like this is where that tradition gets started, but Jesus does it when he reads from the Oh, school, yeah, definitely. Right? Like, mm -hmm. that's neat. Great. Yeah. He does the same. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So kind of where it gets started, just within the Gospels, within these New Testament texts, already the Jesus movement yeah. Is is and Jesus does that the very first time he's announcing his public ministry. Um, I am the one that Isaiah is speaking of when he says that his servant will be sent to proclaim good news, release of the captives, etc. Yeah, great questions. Anything else? Okay, so they have this jarring experience where they are arrested, finally released. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit, through our ancestor David, your servant, 
Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. So this is their prayer after their experience of being arrested. What do you see in this prayer? What stands out to you? What's unique? What do you not see? Yeah, Ben? To me, it's kind of like a question of movement strategy. Mm. Like, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're on us. They're trying to smack us down. Is it going to be better for us to um, preserve our own selves and as much as we want to get out by going into hiding, going lowly or whatever? Uh, or the other, the vice versa, you know, go on the offense and be like, no, we, this is now more than ever time to stand up and be strike. Wow, wow. Ben said this is movement strategy. They're trying to determine, okay, they're standing against us. Do we go into hiding, lay low for a while, let this die down? Or is this the time to go on the offensive, bring the message out, be bold? Yeah. What else do you notice in their prayer? Yeah, that is very interesting. So Robinson, interesting that they mentioned the Gentiles here. And um, in order to bring that into to light, they mentioned Pontius Pilate, um, who's brought back onto the scene here. So most of their opposition is coming from the Jewish community. And yet they're kind of saying, it's not just them. This is universal persecution. Even the Gentiles are raging against us. Yeah. I think it's interesting, and this ties into what you were saying, Ben. The prayer isn't for protection. The prayer isn't for the persecution to stop. Instead, they just want boldness to keep spreading the word, even in the face of threats. beginning of this section again. I, I, I just find the question of audience really interesting. Like, mm. why are they quoting God's word to God? Or why are they saying after after the quotation, like, this is the city where, it's like, it, it sounds like they're talking to an audience beyond. Yeah, interesting. Audience, you know? Interesting. So Kevin said the question of audience is really interesting because we're told that they're praying this to God and quoting scripture to God. Is there another audience? Do they want the people who are gathered at this point? We're told 3000 on the day of Pentecost and then another 5000 after this person was healed. And so are they kind of wanting to get people in the loop of this is how we do our interpretation? Um, it's not unusual in scripture for prayers to God to include quotation of scripture. Um, and I think we see that with our own prayer sometimes, too, where we're praying and say, hey, wait a minute, God, I'm experiencing this. But remember, in scripture, you said this and you said this and you said this. So why is this happening? So I think that's a, a form of prayer, but I think that's great. Is there, a, is there an auditory audience here? Is yeah, there another audience in mind for the writing? Right after the song for whatever it is. Uh, it, it's almost like teaching now. That's like a sermon. Mm -hmm. That's Peter giving a sermon. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We mentioned a third of this book is sermons or, or speaking. So definitely has that feel. Yeah, Carol. Um, the last sentence where it says, and they had saved the place in which they were gathered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, if you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, um, during the passion story of Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection, there's also an earthquake, 
And so it's kind of as if creation is affirming what is happening in their midst. And so they are interpreting um, geological activity as a confirmation of their prayers. So they're praying for boldness. They feel like the place is shaking. This is God telling us, I hear you. Your prayers are answered. Yeah. That would be, yeah, I would love that. Okay, it's shaking. The prayer is going to get answered. That would be really nice. That would be great. Yeah, that would be so nice. Um, any other questions or comments on this? Um, in a very strong way that early. Um, yeah. And then you have to wonder because what was predestined was that Jesus was put to death. They've got to be worrying about what's predestined for them. Oh, yeah. interesting. So that's good. Surely saying if something's predestined or just that a, God has a plan in mind and for Jesus that resulted in death, what does it mean for them? Yeah, I don't, and Imagine there's some anticipation and fear there. Okay, we're going to get another passage paralleling to the end of Acts chapter 2 about what these communities of faith look like. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite from Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right, two explanations of this within two chapters. Why do you think this is of such emphasis? Yeah, Ben? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think the obvious question I answer is that we should take care of each other and love each other, make sure everybody is fed and housed and filled. Right. But um I also think it's kind of trying to show that to go beyond the law, you know, we're taught in the Hebrew scriptures to take care of the widows and the orphans and let the poor weep in the field and stuff like that, which is like the bare minimum. Right? Mm. We're gonna let you all survive. These yeah. poor people that are here. Um, but this is definitely taking it to the next step. So no, mm. we should really have economic equality. Wow. Yeah. So Ben is saying kind of the obvious answer here, making sure people are taken care of, loving each other. But he also sees it as going a step beyond the minimums of Hebrew scriptures. So the law says, take care of the widow and orphan, let the poor glean from your fields. That's just kind of basic survival. This is complete economic equality. So it's taking it a step beyond that's great. Yeah, Carol? But then the last one, he sold the field that belonged to him and then brought the money. It's sort of like, okay, well, he didn't give everything. Mm. You know, he sold a part of it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Carol's saying it says he sold a field that belonged to him, but it doesn't say he sold everything. That's a good observation. In chapter two, I not to go back to it, but it, the way I remember this is sort of like as these came up, they sold things. They didn't sell everything at once or cash it out. But hmm. it like as we came up, they sold their yeah. piece meal time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Kevin was saying, remembering chapter two, it said as needs came up, they would sell property and made sure that those needs were met. This seems to be gathering all their resources and pooling it at the same time. Uh, we're going to get a very interesting story next that may be why this part of it is a little different. It's just kind of possible, but just the name, like um, Joseph, 
you have one to kill this. But viruses need services, and I don't know. Anybody need a virus? Yeah, it's a... Uh... You know, what's really interesting about this name is that it's he's named it because of his spiritual gifts. Like Barnabas. His nickname would be Barney. Barney, his nickname would be in Barney. We know some Barneys, yeah. <laughs> we don't know Barnabas, but we know Barney. That's good. Uh, Barnabas, son of encouragement. How, I mean, seems like a really great guy to know. Barnabas is always going to lift you up and encourage you. The gospel writer of Luke, which we understand to be the same writer of the book of Acts, emphasizes economics more so than any of the gospel writers. And it is the topic most on the mouth of Jesus in the gospel of Luke. Jesus is always talking about money. And even the spiritualized forms of the Sermon on the Mount, something like blessed are the poor in spirit in the Gospel of Matthew, is transformed in the Gospel of Luke to blessed are the poor. A real emphasis for this writer is economic equality, and he's bringing that theme into the early community. How are they working to achieve economic equality, when we see the religious leaders and their corruption not carrying out the vision of Jesus, vision of God from the Hebrew scriptures of what economic equality can look like. And so that's very much at play here. And we're going to get a scary, interesting story to begin with. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, little trap here. Uh, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such a such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. So that's probably the most bizarre story in all the book of Acts. So we're not going to get a lot more like this. But what do you see at face value? What do you see that might be a little deeper? The, 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 the deceit. Say that again? The deceit. The deceit. The deceit. The deceit's at what state? He says, look, the land was yours. You could have kept the land. When you sold it, the money was yours. Do whatever you want with the money. But the fact that you told us you were giving us all of the proceeds when, in fact, you weren't, the deceit is what's at uh, stake here. Yeah. Other observations? It goes to what was their purpose and why were they simply greedy and wanted to hold on to some of the money, although they felt the pressure to do what everybody else was doing, or are they trying to be the, the great teacher, you know, it was wonderful and better and whatever, and just kind of hiding what was hmm. Yeah, great questions. What what's at stake here? What are the what are the emotions? What are the reasoning behind it? Hard to say. Are they doing it just because they want 
attention? Are they doing it because they're afraid? Are they just going along with it? The, these are great observations. Yeah. Yeah, what's at stake is the deceit and also what is our relationship to the Holy Spirit? Is at stake here as well? The Holy Spirit is a new gift to the community. The fact that God is in the midst of the people at all times and that they're doing this work in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they're going to wrestle with who receives the Spirit and how do you use the Spirit. Later, there's going to be a story about someone coming to the disciples, wanting to buy the Holy Spirit. I see that the Spirit is powerful in you. I would like that too. How much is it going to cost me? And the disciples reprimand this person that you don't purchase the Holy Spirit. And you also don't deceive the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is moving at all times. And so to think that you can somehow trick the Spirit or deceive the Spirit or work around the Spirit. There's a declaration here that the Spirit of God knows all things. And so there's not the potential to deceive the Spirit. Um, this is kind of a, um, yeah, it seems almost as if it's the folklore of the community to kind of scare people when you enter, like, don't mess with this system. We're trying to share everything. And if you want to be part of the community, well, did you hear about Ananias and yeah. Sapphira? Yeah. The thing that's really scary is that they didn't, they didn't kill him. They didn't strike him down. They they fell down dead. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, On the other hand, it's it's harsh for him to say that Jesus did. Definitely harsher than yeah. No one's falling down dead around Jesus. He gave people chances to repent. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just a shortened version. Yeah. 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 And Peter's. I mean, he's definitely condoning it. I mean, he said like. The people who buried your husband are going to come and get you. I, I, I think I think of uh, Elisha when he got the power of God, and the boys were making fun of them. He called them the curse, and animals came and attacked them, or yeah, something like yeah. that. Like having mm -hmm. the power of the Holy Spirit is sometimes like, is that really how you want to use it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think we should. Uh, I, I have no way to make this not uncomfortable. And it's uncomfortable for the whole community. Great fear sees the whole church. And I think it's a great observation, Shirley, that this is unlike anything we get with Jesus, who's never trying to instill fear into people, who's never beyond opportunities for repentance. And so this story that's probably shared throughout the community should be um, leading them to ask the question, how do we use the spirit? So Robin mentioned a story of um, when Elisha is made fun of for being bald by some young boys, he calls out bears to come and maul them. Like, oh my God, uh, it's very sensitive. Uh, same thing here. Wow. Yeah, they put the spirit to the test and it's a serious offense, but the repercussions. Ooh. Um, there's a, yeah, go ahead, Rick. I, I just was thinking, I'm glad that uh, you, Pastor Jen, do not use these kinds of methods to motivate us. <laughs> this, we, we just spent a few days planning and we were thinking about stewardship season. This is what we got to do during stewardship <laughs> season. So it's everything you have, Rick. The spirit is at the door. Um, no, yeah, not using these methods. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> One thing, just looking back from now, this was a little bit of a scratch, but when you're a religious community within a secular government, like if you think about all the scandals about the way the contemporary church handles money, you know, it's sort of like our finances have to be above the church. Mm. Um, and that's, yeah. Yeah. That's part of what I did. Yeah. Um, 
Kevin saying, just thinking about the ways in which our modern religious institutions in the news mishandle finances all the time. And for this to be a declaration of our finances have to be above board and transparent. I think that's a great observation. And just, I think it ties into your comment, Ben, about um, strategy. What is, hey, Jim, uh, what is our strategy for how we're going to operate? We've decided we're sharing our resources, but if we're going to do that, it's got to be honest. It's got to be upfront. Barnabas came and sold and gave what he had. And I like that. Maybe it wasn't everything that he had. It was one of the fields he had, but he was honest about it. Here's the dishonesty and the dishonesty and the deceit is going to totally destroy the community. And so just like the Sadducees and scribes are worried about protecting Judaism, there's obviously some self-preservation here too. Our community's going to disintegrate and split unless we're completely above board with each other. All right, uh, do I want to end there? <laughs> I think we might. Um, okay, so we're going to get some more healing and more persecution, and this is going to be a fun story. Literally fun, not as fun as Ananias and Sapphira. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah, Ben. I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I see a lot of things going on here. Um, so I'm going to include the ones we've talked about. But uh, if, if we're looking to Acts as, as you know, these are the first Christians, these are the first uh, most legitimate way to practice. And it really, you know, so it, it's not just a question of how they have the spirit, but also how do they have our possessions. Right, are we, what are we going to do with this economy? And um, it's it's not like 100 percent clear. Like, give your give up everything, give your possessions. I mean, Jesus tells the rich man or the young man, or mm -hmm. the rich young man, uh, you know, how do I get the kingdom after he's already kept the law and all that stuff? And he says, you know, give your give, uh, sell everything and give your possessions. And the guy was really sad, but it didn't seem like that was to everybody. He was. Asking like a, a question for myself, how do I do it? And even here, it's not saying everybody who's now a Christian uh, or part of the Jesus movement, whatever, um, you all have to do this. But there's it's like a volunteer, it's a voluntary, it's a voluntary contribution. But um, at least it, it seems like it. But the fact that if you're not going to give everything, because there's a deceit, yeah, but it's also the not. Not uh, you know uh, turning over, giving giving up everything, giving your whole life to Jesus, basically. Right? Um, that is going on in the Ananias and Sapphira story, um, and so it seems like that's what you have to do. You have to give your whole life, up, right? Mm. Your whole everything your possessions. So yeah. I think some of the Christians took that really seriously and did try to you know communize. Um, and I think those are those stories are very inspirational. Those histories. Um, uh, but uh, I think we're still dealing with this like, how much do I have to give up? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but whether it's you know, my whole spirit, all my time, all my money, everything, yeah. or not, yeah, there's that, there's that, like, how much do we I mean, accommodate to, yeah, you know, capitalism doesn't yeah. Us yeah, yeah, thank you. So, Ben saying. We wrestle with these questions still. We look to Jesus and his teachings and we think to ourselves, exactly how much do I have to give up here? And Ben pointing out that we see examples of some folks in scripture taking that call very seriously, but that it also seems voluntary. This isn't prescriptive. In order to follow Jesus, you must do this. He's speaking directly to the rich young ruler in the gospels, not saying it to all of those gathered. And so it's a question that we wrestle with and Ben saying this capitalistic economic structure makes it pretty complicated to do something like this, unless it was being done at an extremely micro local level. Um, if we were all to create a commune together. Yeah. One maybe slight positive that I see in this is that Sapphira would have just been under her husband's rule. Why would she be even important in this? In the general oh. way things she's being held equally accountable, which is actually a kind of equality, which is 
Wow. Um, thank you for noticing that. Yeah. Um, Shirley said, what's interesting here is that Sapphira isn't simply under her husband's direction and rule as she would have been in the society. But here she's the one giving consent and being held accountable for her own decisions and being communicated to directly. So a little bit of gender equality amidst the strangeness of the story. I like that. Um, okay, we will continue with chapter five next Sunday. Let me close this with a word of prayer. God, as we come to you and study your scriptures, we recognize that sometimes these words give us pause and make us furl our eyebrows and like the community gathered, um, you know, this is uncomfortable. Uh, but as we continue to try to allow your spirit to lead us, to allow your spirit to bring good news, to allow your spirit to bring healing to communities, we ask that we, like these early apostles, might be part of the work of bringing restoration to people. And we pray that we can wrestle with these questions ourselves about where you're leading us and how we can be honest with each other and how we can follow the direction of the Spirit. So please continue to provide us guidance and boldness like these early apostles. In Christ's name, amen.